Good morning, and welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. My name is Deacon Emily Myalis, and on behalf of the whole congregation here, we welcome you to worship today. Uh, this is our first service of today. We have another service that will be outside at 10 a.m., and it's at that service that we will be praying for and sending out our youth who are going to the National Youth Gathering in New Orleans, and they're headed out tomorrow, and so we will be sending them out with our blessings, and we keep them in our prayers at this service as well. And as we think about travel and summertime, uh, we welcome you again wherever you are, whether you're here in Lidditz or on your own vacation doing some of your traveling. Now we join together to worship. Today we will be hearing about these days of panic and we will be hearing about God's road of purpose. So as we think about that, wherever you're coming from and wherever, however you're feeling today, uh, we bring those feelings sometimes of panic and we bring them now to the foot of the cross, knowing that God has purpose for us. So hear those words today as we worship, settle in, take a deep breath and know that you are in the presence of the living Lord here this day, that we might have our eyes lifted, our eyes lifted to, to him and to his glory. And so I invite you to take a breath and know that you have entered in the presence of the living Lord. Please rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin. Receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pause for reflection as we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. By grace you have been saved. Out of great love, God sent the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And as Jesus lives victorious from the grave, I declare to you that in his name your sins are forgiven. Amen. Together we join in singing hymn number 880, O God Beyond All Praising. Christ, the communion of saints, and this, the communion, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and praise to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. From you come all the holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Much to be seated for our readings. The next six weeks are going to be hearing from the letter to the Ephesians. And uh, one thing just to keep in mind as it's written is that it's written by Paul when he's in prison. And so these words today are words of somebody who's wrestling with what does it mean to have a purpose in an upside down world. This morning's reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, and may be found on page 251 in the New Testament of the Pew Bibles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
and had believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in reading responsibly Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13, as printed in your bulletin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Truly his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you. Last week we heard about Jesus sending out the 12 disciples, and another event now takes place, and that is that John the Baptist was beheaded. His head was served on a silver platter in a vengeance move of internal politics in the house of Herod. Whew. The apostles gathered around Jesus, who had just heard this, and they told him all that they had done and taught, and he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized him, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Good morning, church. We welcome our children to come and join me here for a message this morning. It's fun to see so many of you here on a hot summer day, and I have something for you that I'm excited to, to show you. Something pretty sweet. I think you're gonna wanna come on over. In my box here, I have some, something really good, something really green, and something that I wanted to tell you about. Because in my box, I have a little collection here of some lollipops. And I was thinking about these lollipops because, let me tell you, this lollipop I got at the post office. And when I was waiting in line, this lollipop really helped me feel like I wasn't there for too long. And that, that made me happy. And this lollipop, this one I got at a parade, and I was there with, with family, and so that, this one was really fun to see people in the community together, and let me see here. Oh, this lollipop, I think, was maybe from Halloween, and then I was with my neighbors, and we were giving treats to each other, and so this lollipop, this lollipop really brought a lot of joy that night, and... Let me see here. Oh, this lollipop, I think, was from the hardware store. And you know you're busy shopping, and then the lollipop sometimes you get at the end of your shopping trip, and it just makes you feel like it's fun to go take care of all the business that you have to do when you need to go shopping. 
And I had one more lollipop I wanted to tell you about. And it's this lollipop and this one I got here at the school because our church has a school and on Fridays they give lollipops, Lollipop Friday. And then that made me really happy too that we have a school here where we can learn and grow when we're kids. So I'm showing you a lot of lollipops, aren't I? And I want to tell you something because thinking about all these lollipops made me think about the good news that we heard today that the Apostle Paul wrote about when he was writing to his friends about the goodness of Jesus and our purpose. So all these lollipops, what color are all of them? Green. Yeah, they're all the same lollipop, aren't they? They're all the same color and they all taste the same and they're all really good, aren't they? They're all really yummy. But each lollipop had a special purpose, didn't it? So they're all the same, but I got them from different places, and they all had a different purpose why you'd have a lollipop, maybe at a store, maybe at an event. So they all have a special reason to why you might get a lollipop, and that makes me think about us too. Well, let me tell you real quick, okay? Because God's love is that good. It's so good. It's so wonderfully given, Paul says, this free gift that we have from Jesus Christ and that we too have a purpose with Jesus too. So we are all some ways the same, but we also have a special purpose in Jesus Christ. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And guess what? I'm going to share with you a lollipop too. And I hope when you eat your lollipop, as you lick it, as you think about your purpose, in Jesus. He's given you special gifts, but it all is that free and delicious and wonderful gift through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's say a prayer before you come up for your lollipop. And also I have kids bulletins too, and they're green as well because we are in the green season. Let's pray. Okay? Let's fold our hands and you can repeat after me and then I think I have some stories to listen to. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. For your sweet gift of loving us. Amen. Okay, so lollipops, you can take one and a paper, a kid's bulletin, you can also take one. What did you want to tell me about? Last week, I preached about how the political realities in our country are unsettling, difficult, causing us grief and great concern about our nation, and that I wanted to remind us that ultimately the world has always been a complex, jumbled place that has violent proclivities. And that our calling, though, was just like Jesus sent out his disciples into the world 2,000 years ago that was crazy and complicated. Jesus sends us out, two by two, into the world. And that, in fact, as we love and serve our neighbor, we can restitch the fabric of a fragmented society. I feel like I could literally go, like, in the old school, like, press rewind, press stop, and press play again today for the same thing. That again, we live in a complex, broken world that is sinful and leans towards violence. And this can cause us, when we look at that political world, to feel totally overwhelmed, grieved, hurt, upset, angry, and afraid. 
but this was the world into which Jesus sent out his disciples. It's the world into which Jesus sends us out to love and serve our neighbor. And again, maybe, just maybe, in so doing, to restitch the fabric of our divided and fragmented nation. But I don't want to give the same sermon twice. I want to take a different tact today. I want to reflect with you on, on the tumultuousness of the world in, in a different way. Way. And, and I want to think with you about how we go in our lives from panic to purpose. Okay? I want to reflect with you on how we move from panic to purpose. Because inevitably in our lives, there's stuff that happens, and it could be, again, in the political news cycle. It could just be, on a personal level, stuff that, that just happens. Life comes at us so fast, and it's really overwhelming, but eventually we want to get to, but sometimes we find we're not able to get there to a place of peace and purpose to move forward. Because that's exactly what happens in the story today that I read to you from the Gospel of Mark. There is this gruesome story of the beheading of John the Baptist. It's a, it's a tale of, of lust and greed vengeance. There's not much gospel in it. It's a very hard and upsetting story. It would be one that for Jesus would be a political sort of big picture the way the world works reality, but it was also one where John the Baptist was a relative of his. And uh, as Mark says, when his disciples heard about it, they took his body and laid John in the tomb. Jesus knows this is foreshadowing of what is going to happen to him. So for Jesus, this is really overwhelming news. But by the end here of the story that I read, by the end of it, Jesus is going to be in a position where out of his great compassion, he's going to do one of his great miracles and feed 5,000 people. Again, Jesus here moves from a state of, of panic, of feeling overwhelmed by the, the bad news of the world to delivering this amazing good news of compassion and mercy. So how does Jesus metabolize panic and turn it into purpose? Well, the short answer is he's God and we're not. <laughs> But might we be able to learn something about, again, how to move from panic to, to purpose? And I think this is something that's, again, so, so important for us. This week I was meeting with a family, and about a year ago or so, this, uh, this family, they lost a niece who was eight months old to a choking accident. And so they were devastated by this news, and a year later it still continues to weigh on their hearts. But at the same time, they have kids. They have their own kids, and, and their own kids are, and, and other nieces and nephews, and, and their own kids are asking the questions about, you know, what is heaven like? Part of what happens to us is, I think, something like what happens to Jesus here, where on the one hand, there's this really terrible news of John the Baptist's death. On the other hand, there's this great news of what the disciples experienced when they went out and they did work in his name. So you think about, like, again, they're all coming back and there's, like, too many trains coming into the station. I think we can feel that way a lot in life where it's not just that there's bad news in the world. It's not just that there are stories of grief or sorrow or violence. There's also stories of beauty, of growth, of new life of possibilities and opportunities of dreams. And, and they just sort of all seem to collide, right? They all want to come into the station at once. So what Jesus tells his disciples to do is he says, let's get away. Let's take a pause. Jesus doesn't say, well, I want you guys all to get on your phones now and tell me what the 75 pundits across the Mediterranean are saying about what Herod did. Right, And he doesn't say, I really want you guys to spend all your time uploading this because we've got to increase our marketing brand presence. He says, let's just come away. Let's take a pause. Let's take a pause and reflect on what we're doing. 
Again, the first way to move from panic to purpose is to take a pause, to just take a breath. I was uh, meeting with a family this week, and and the dad was sharing about how they have a, a teenager and how they're helping their teenager develop tools. Because, right, if there's any sort of impulsive mind in the world, it's teenagers. And how do we help this teenager develop skills to, to write, to breathe, to go do physical activity, to kind of work down? And as I listened to him, I thought, wow, that's not just good advice, though, for teenagers. That's, that's what we all need, right? We all need a way to kind of press pause, and we sort of have all this stuff just kind of bubbling up, and what do we do with it, lest it just sort of control sort of how we're, we're moving? Again, we all need ways to, to take pause and to cope with the, the speed, the frenetic speed of life. It's interesting that in the boomer generation, many people who grew up in church in the 50s and the 60s decided they wanted something more exciting by the 70s and 80s, wanted more up-tempo, right? There, you can't have songs in a minor key, and they cannot be slow. But it's actually interesting that as time has moved on, the, the next and the coming generations of the sort of the millennials and the Gen Zs and the Gen Xs, they're more and more drawn to liturgy more and more drawn to worship services and prayer practices that are contemplative. I think as life has, has sped up, all of us have, have realized that need for a pause, a break not just from social media, but just a time to reflect and to begin to unpack with God what's going on in our lives. So again, we all are hungry to move from panic to purpose, and the first step is just taking a pause. And part of what happens when we, we take a pause is that at some level we've got to confront pain. We've got to come to terms with, with really what is agitating us, what is so deeply unsettling. I can't imagine that Jesus or the disciples, when they heard about John the Baptist. In fact, some of the disciples of Jesus were earlier disciples of John the Baptist. How this news just must have ripped their hearts. And to go away and to pause and to leave all the distraction behind means in some ways they've got to face, face the, the difficulty of what's going on. But I think it's really important for us to at least acknowledge the hurt that's going on inside I've started on the evaluations of staff members at the church to include a section of were there things in the last year that were going on in that person's life that would have affected them. I don't remember such a category when I was having performance evaluations in New York City. It was pretty much how did I produce. But what I want to acknowledge for myself and, and the staff is that we all kind of carry stuff. There's all stuff that's going on in our lives, and it impacts us. And we were, again, a lot of us were taught to sort of compartmentalize and to kind of, you know, put, put like our feelings and our work aside. But we've discovered neurologically that's impossible. The part of your brain that makes rational decisions, in order for any impulses to get there, it has to go through the part of your brain that processes emotions. There, there is no way as a human to make completely emotion-free decisions. All of us are, are emotional creatures. And when we get in trouble is when we don't recognize how strong our emotions are. When we don't recognize how much we're actually hurting. That's when we begin to really get ourselves and others in trouble because, again, we don't realize that we're right on a tectonic plate or that we're leaning right into one of our triggers and our buttons. And then we wonder why we're so quick to just stay in that panic mode. So part of what we've got to do if we want to move from panic to purpose is to take time there to begin to unpack what's really going on. And to do so... To do so with Jesus, this isn't simply a psychological exercise, but Jesus invites his disciples away with him. For really, in the end of the day, the only one who can truly 
metabolize pain is Jesus. So to spend this time and to begin to recognize what's going on and begin to wrestle with that, to turn it over to Christ and to his cross that he might transform it into something holy, something beautiful, even productive. There's something else, though, that we have to do if we're going to begin to really transform our panic into a purpose. And that is that we have to praise God. Again, if we're going to transform our panic into purpose, at some point we have to move into praising the living Lord. I know this is what the disciples were doing when they came back and sharing about how they had healed people, how they had proclaimed repentance, how they had cast out demons. I know that they were rejoicing to tell Jesus, this is what has happened in in my life. This is how I saw your powers, Lord Jesus, working through me. And I saw people who, who suddenly were walking, who were dancing, who were singing, who were embracing, who were forgiving each other. Today we also heard from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we're going to be picking this up more and more the next few weeks. Paul writes this letter from prison. He's been in prison for preaching the gospel. It's a complex process by which he offended multiple groups, but in the end he's, he's there because of his loyalty and his devotion to Jesus. And yet here we have Paul who's in prison who has every right to be mad and bitter at God about what has transpired in his life. And instead he's saying, blessed be, blessed be our Lord, our God. This is the one who brings all things together in whom we have eternal life in whom we find forgiveness. You see, what happens that in life when we, again, get all of this news be it the bad news of the world or really just the intense stuff we hear about our family and our friends that's so upsetting. When we, when we get that all, it's really easy for us to turn, turn and, and focus then on what we lack, right? To have that fight or flight response, to think of that reptile part of our brain, to get into battle mode and to focus on what we as humans lack, What happens, though, is that when we praise the living Lord, we have our eyes lifted to the hills. And we remember that, in fact, this world isn't simply governed by humans. And that my life isn't constrained simply by my sinfulness or my lack of resources. But that we have a Redeemer, we have a Savior, we have one who is strong and mighty to save, whose compassion doesn't exhaust like ours does as humans. And then when we do that, when we've taken that pause and we have begun to sort of think about what's really going on in our hearts, and we begin to really think about what's going on with God and God's greatness, out of that then, that can begin to form a purpose a way forward for us in this muddy and complicated world. One of the charities that we support at our church is the Madonna Initiative, and it's, it's uh, this way in, in which um, children in Ethiopian elementary schools are being given medical treatment. And it, it started out because some of our members in our church went over to Ethiopia to adopt And that just opened up their hearts to what was going on. And it it took a long time. It took some real pause. It took some real prayer. It took some acknowledgement of the pain as well as some (laughs) praise of God. But ultimately that transforms that again into a purpose. So when I think about the events of this last week, unsettling, disturbing, horrifying And I need to think about it more. But it brings me to a place of purpose. That it's so needed right now for us to have a, a community like St. Paul where each week Jesus gathers us. Jesus gathers us and invites us to, to lay down our burdens and to have our eyes lifted to his forgiveness, his glory, his resurrection. 
where we can go and we can take, take our panic. And by the power of his cross and by the power of his resurrection, have it transformed by and by into our purposes in this world in his name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Growing in faith and discipleship, we give thanks for God's merciful compassion as we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, when there is death, cruelty, and violence, 
you respond with compassion and grace. Give us faith to believe that the darkness in the world cannot overcome the true light, your Son. We pray for the leaders of our nation and of our world. May they not fall into temptation like Herod and put their own lusts and agendas ahead of the common good. We pray for your spirit of wisdom to guide leaders and politicians whose decisions impact so many. Together we pray. Holy God, we pray for all caregivers, nurses, doctors, therapists, hospice workers, and chaplains. We lift before you the work of the Swansons in Arusha, Tanzania. We pray for the Ministry of the Medan Initiative. Bring abundance of life to all who long for healing especially those whom we lift before you out loud or in the silence of our hearts together. I'll give you a minute to pray. Together we pray. God, you have claimed the faithful departed as your own and given them the inheritance in glory. We thank you for the witness of those who have gone before us in faith and endured times of sickness, persecution, and struggle. Sustain us in faith until the fullness of time when you gather up all things in heaven and on earth. Together, we pray. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Holy God, we lift to you these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please share the peace. I invite you all to be seated. This uh, Sunday at the second service, we will be uh, praying for a number of youth who are, uh, there's 11 youth and three adult leaders who are headed off to the National Youth Gathering. Uh, and I thank you all, really over the last, because of COVID, really over the last almost six years, of uh, contributing towards those efforts and keeping that reasonable for, for families. Also, we, I know we had a number of people who joined in June and then came to a welcome class last week. If you're new to St. Paul and just curious about the ministry here, you can fill out one of the blue cards and put in the offering plate. And we will actually have a welcome class, another one in September. Let's see what else. 
Uh, also, I will announce now that there's a couple events in August, one of which is that we'll have a recital for two of our graduating seniors on, on August 10th. So again, something else to look forward to. And lastly, um, you are not allowed to get sick this Thursday because uh, this Thursday, there is a 24-hour gap between my vacation and Pastor Wallace returning from vacation, and that's Thursday. So there's no Bible study on Thursday, and you're not allowed to get critically sick that day either. Well, good. So, again, I thank you for your generosity that allows us to support youth going on mission trips and all sorts of other ministries, and I invite us to rise as we present our gifts. Let the vineyards be fruitful. join me in prayer. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, through Christ. And so the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. After he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we do this, we proclaim the great mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, and in that hope we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this point of our worship service, we'll be moving to communion. And if you are in a place where you can join us, you're always invited to drive over. If you would also like to have communion taken to your home, please contact the church office and one of our pastors or one of our communion assistants will be able to bring communion to you. Today we heard about that move from panic to purpose and it's a move that we make through the gift of our son, God's son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. 
And so we cling to that promise and we follow that way and we are secure in that hope. So please go in that hope now, knowing that you have a purpose, that we together have a purpose, and that God's purpose for us is good and holy and dwelling among us. God bless you. Amen.